Okay, so we're going to talk about the Euro crisis and specifically what's happening in Greece. Um, it's on the eve of the Greek elections, but we're not actually going to concentrate on the elections. We're going to look at this in a more general sense. Uh, there's four of us here tonight. Uh, I'm Andrew. I'm kind of recording this. I'm a member of the Workers' Solidarity Movement in Dublin. I have no particular connection with Greece, but uh, I'm the one with the technology. And I'm Paul Bowman. I'm also Workers' Solidarity Movement. Um, I don't have a specific connection with Greece, but I spent a lot of time the last year or two sort of looking into matters relating to the Euro crisis and so on. Yeah, and uh, I'm Kostas Adamidis, I am a um, Greek Atlantia, member of the Workers' Solidarity Movement. Um, I have a connection with Greece. I was born and lived until the 26th year of my life, and that it was something like 12 years back. And I have um, a slight idea about uh, things back home because of relatives and friends and comrades. Hi, I'm Irma. I'm living in Greece for the last 10 years. I finished school there and I did my university uh, BA there. Okay, so let's start off with the, the general context, uh, which is this ongoing crisis in the Euro that Greece has been fairly central to, along with Ireland. Uh, and it's got a lot of attention at the moment because of the Greek elections that are due to play, take place on Sunday and are seen as a, a kind of threat to the whole austerity drive. Um, <coughs> Maybe Paul, do you want to fill us in with it? Yeah, um, well, the, the, if a Martian was to land from outer space, they might be inquiring as to why suddenly all the world was focusing on an election in a country like Greece, um, which is only 11 million people, and um, together with uh, Ireland and Portugal, all three of us make up less than 5% of the Eurozone, and the Eurozone, of course, is only part of Europe and is only part of the global system. So why are people from Obama in, in Washington to the new French president and you know commentators up to China and Australia all talking about the Greek election? Um, <clears throat> it's a good question. Um, basically, since 2010, the results of the, the global financial crash in 2008 started to show things coming undone within the Eurozone. The Eurozone creates a fixed rate of exchange between all its members because we all have the same currency, but at the same time allows a free flow of capital between countries. At the time of its creation of the Eurozone, um, the growth rates in Germany and France, the core of the Eurozone, if you like, were depressed particularly depressed in Germany because of the results of a, another unification, German reunification. Um, and there were higher growth rates in peripheral countries like Ireland, Spain, Portugal, and Greece at the time. So the, the investors from the, the core countries felt safe to, for large amounts of money to flow into the smaller areas, but where there was higher rates of growth. Um, since the crash, and that the sort of the bursting of the various property bubbles in places like Ireland and Spain, um, Greece, not so much a property bubble, but the, the, the more long-term sort of financial problems that have been sort of papered over, if you like, by the, the move, the free flow of this capital around Europe. Um, and then we got into a crisis beginning of, February 2010, so this sort of crisis now has been going on for two years, um, or nearly two and a half years in fact. The dominant strategy from France and Germany and many of the northern countries is that basically to blame people in the peripherals for the, um, the sort of the economic crisis. Um, to administer the medicine of austerity, um, to get governments to deal with the, their sovereign debt crises, which in most cases were to do with either taking on the, the, the bank problems, um, and I think even without the property bubble, the bank problems are a big part of the story in Greece as well. 
So the, there's a general European banking crisis, which in the peripherals has turned into a sovereign debt crisis. Um, but so from yeah, the medicine of austerity, of course, uh, cuts public sector employment, it cuts wages, it cuts pensions, it cuts health benefits, and so on. It raises bills, and the end result, as we can see, is the spiraling into depression. Um, of all of the countries that are having it, the austerity medicine put on it. But in, in Greece's case, the depression has been, um, I think in the last year, lost 8% of GDP or something like that. It's, it's been extremely severe. If you like, huge raise in unemployment, absolute poverty. Um, I, well, things that we can talk about later, sorry. Um, but the question of why Greece is basically is because the first. Um, situation to effectively become bankrupt. Um, and even though the actual amounts of money involved compared to the money available collectively to the Eurozone is actually very small, um, the problem is not an economic one, it's a political one, if you like, that the, 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 the viewpoint of the core countries is that to uh, give in and to, to share the load, if you like, to to allow transfer of funds for reconstruction in the way that, for example, West Germany transfer funds to East Germany for reconstruction there. But to do that at a European level is politically unsellable to governments that in the end are responsible only to their own local people for their re-election. So for German politicians to tell German citizens that really in order to restore productivity and competitivity in peripheral countries like Greece or Spain or whatever, there needs to be an investment of capital into those areas. The German electorate are not prepared to listen to that. So that's kind of where we are. Um, at the end of last year, I can't remember where we, we had the, the we ended up with this, uh, the pass up government fell in November last year. Um, because of the terms of the second Greek bailout meant uh, a, a further, another memorandum of understanding with uh, even more austerity. Um, the Prime Minister of Greece, Papandreou, decided to, uh, to raise this uh, threat of putting a referendum to the Greek people as to whether this memorandum was understandable or not. Um, and the reaction <laughs> on a global level from the, both the, the Eurozone governments and everybody else, that this uh, idea of, of putting an economic decision to the Greek people was just scandalous and completely unacceptable. And he was essentially forced out of office and replaced by a technocratic government appointed more or less from, from Frankfurt and Brussels. Um, that government held on until this May um, when there was an election, the election was inconclusive because for the first time ever, even the combination of the, the two main parties since the dictatorship of PASOK and New Democracy, um, even put together, they could not form a government. Um, however, there was an impasse on the other side because neither could uh, the anti-memorandum forces uh, mainly Syriza, the KKE, um, and some right-wing parties, including the Nazis. Um, a, a government, an anti-memorandum government couldn't be formed with those, those parties. So now we have a repeat election, um, and basically all of the propaganda from the mainstream media in the European countries, the core countries, has basically been an attempt to terrorize Greek people into voting for the, the, the institutional parties of either Pass Up or New Democracy or someone um, and accept the memorandum, essentially. Um, but there is a, there's a question mark of the, the, the same impasse that appeared in May is most likely to, to reappear, in fact. Um, the, uh, just the one final detail on, on the election before we actually talk about Greece itself is a lot of people have noticed that the Greek uh, system has this peculiar feature that you elect 200 
members of parliament, but an extra 50 seats are given to the party that gets the most votes. And many people in the media here in Ireland and Britain have thought that if Syriza get the most votes, they will get the 50 seats, but they won't because Syriza is a coalition and these 50 seats are basically to institutionalize the pass on new democracy, sharing of power so that it's, it's split between the various parties of a coalition. So even if Syriza get on Sunday, get more votes than anybody else than new democracy, the 50 seats will still go to new democracy. And it's also likely that the Greek Communist Party will still continue to refuse to work with anybody. Okay, so leaving aside the complexities of the Greek political system for a moment, um, I think one of the things that's all often missing from the kind of mainstream media coverage of our actions is, is what life is like in Greece, ordinary Greek people nowadays. Um, you know, like the discussion tends to be all on the level of the government and, you know, the kind of national figures and things. Um, so I know you've both been back in the last couple of years uh, and you know, have quite a lot of stories about it that are quite you know, well, disturbing to some extent, I think, and you'll also see some of that in, in terms of the mainstream media. I mean, how is the crisis actually impacting uh, people in Greece? Um, the thing is that um, for the last three years, uh, it's getting worse and worse every, every day. You see the local shops closing, you see people getting unemployed in ages where they can't find jobs, like when somebody is 50 or 60 and you, you throw them away, they, they can't find another job, so these people are desperate. And you see many cases of people committing suicides because of being desperate, because of having huge loans from banks and they're kicked off their places and they can't afford having their kids at, uh, at home. And you see cases of kids at school fainting because of not not having food that day. So th things are getting worse and worse. Uh, in, in all the aspects, things are getting worse uh, even as far as the, the Nazis are concerned. In the previous elections, they got 0 0.2, and in the, these elections, they got 6%, when the first party got 16. Uh, so uh, the, I don't know how the people can can act like that, but apparently it's, it's the case that uh, they are threatened and when somebody is in a vulnerable position they kind of react, they, they kind of show their anger to the to the most weak people of the society and that, in that case the weakest ones are the immigrants there. And uh, I personally was a teacher in, in, in school for immigrants the previous year and uh, we had uh, cases of the, uh, the Golden Dawn coming to our school and uh, throwing stones and uh, Molotov cocktails wherever and it was a huge deal and people would talk about that for months but now it, it is happening on a daily basis and people are not even t but when you see this happening again and again and when when you see the Golden Dawn people on TV every day it stops being uh, something strange and you kind of think stop thinking that it should not be happening so no, I, th I think on, on their side, the uh, people in television are, are making things worse by having advertised the Golden Dawn. And uh, even though many people say that uh, they will not vote for them now, um, the predictions are that they will still get uh, in, in the parliament and they will maintain their 6% or maybe 4 5 Yeah, I suppose you know, like I can cover a little bit of everything. I suppose you know, like from my experience, because um, uh, Irma has um, much wide, more accurate knowledge of things, because she was recently back home than me. That I go more like uh, visiting family and friends. So, from from my understanding, though, that it's very much close to Irma's understanding, is that um, uh, I take the, the things one by one. Homeless. Um, homeless. I remember back home, like uh, people that they were homeless, they were uh, they were marked as tramps and things, and there were specific people all around, and you knew with the where they were, and there were a few thousand, and it was kind of normal. Uh, not that it makes it normal, but now we're talking about armies of homeless people, and uh, these guys they are realizing uh, the Greek people realizing that actually even the homeless back in time. 
it wasn't a phenomenon because, there were, because of the fact that they were trans or something, because they were excluded from the system. And now, as capitalism gets more fair out, wilder, excludes more people. So it has put on uh, the other ground more people, more homeless. Unemployed, uh, I was reading like recently that uh, they have reached 1.2 million in a workforce of six, I think, and it has hit uh, the most, uh, uh, it has hit the youth with 53% or something, 55%, and one out of two, you can say, of youth, like from 18 to 30 years old, they, it's a lot, you know, you might get a job, you might not, most likely you wouldn't get one. And the women, women, they suffer very much, they're going back to the old models of you stay home and uh, do the housework. And, you know, we're going to that kind of behavior, like the man, if you manage to get a job, you go macho and get, bring the home bacon, that kind of behavior. It has a social impact, massive social impact in all levels, the, uh, the situation. The another one that is massive, it's medical care. There was a very bad HSC equivalent uh, national health system in, in Greece called the SIN. That it wasn't the best uh, thing ever, but at the end of the day it had a structure and it was working more or less. Now there is hospitals that they are closed, except whole wings of, of hospitals that they are completely abandoned. They lack in medicine and medical equipment to treat people. People, they go in home without, with open chest. We're talking about extremes, I know it might sound weird, but they have happened in recent times now, like the last two years. People, they go not uh, done with their operation back home. And uh, people, they, they have paid into pension funds, included medical care and medicine. Uh, they go to pharmacies and they can't get the medicine because they don't have the money, they have to pay a, a subscription of medicine and they, uh, they can't cover it with their pensions that they have been slashed. Uh, some cases even half uh, the, the money that they used to get before the cri crisis started that they weren't much. The, the people, like I remember that four years back, people that were coming out in the States and were discussing how they're gonna raise salaries and pensions, right? And all of a sudden, instead of going this way, they went completely the other way around. And you have half the pensions and half the salaries with uh, a very expensive um, um, life, uh, not lifestyle, but uh, a very expensive counter. Greece is an expensive counter. It has Irish prices with uh, a fifth of the salaries and a fifth of the pensions uh, to, deal, uh, to, to deal with. That makes it extremely hard. Um, another social, uh, in, uh, social impact of not only the crisis, it, even, it has made it much worse. Is a lot of people, they have been staying with their uh, fi primal fa prime family, like mother, father, and sons, daughters, whatever, they would stay in the house of the father because they can't afford to go nowhere, not renting a house, but renting a room. So you have families that they are not so extensive, but you have families that they, the son can be 35 years old, unemployed, the, the daughter the same, and they still live in the house with no prospect of getting out. We talk about the personal independence as well, that it has ceased to exist. Um, I think Irma made a little comment about the suicide, that actually they, they have political, uh, uh, not anymore aspect, uh, political speculation, but people actually they commit suicide and they're writing letters, uh, leave them behind them. They blame in the, the political, the social political situation for doing so. Like there is no uh, excuses anymore as such of the of the of the of the system of the establishment to say that this is a couple of loopers that they were depressed that had psychological problems etc etc and they chose to go down there all some uh, emotional disappointment like a, 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 an affair that went wrong or that kind of thing. There's no excuses as such. The, the rise of fascism, neo-Nazism, -Nazi, uh, 
Uh, it was long time coming, in a sense, like if you had stayed in here, years in Greece, uh, it was always hidden. The extremists, uh, they will find shelter within the conservative party, and not only, other parties as well. They were there, there was beatings and things, but uh, to manage to build uh, uh, um, a support of that magnitude is... I don't know, for me that I'm living here is just has blown my mind. I, I can't digest it. You know, it's very hard. And the last one that is related to the, that I want to mention to, very briefly to the rise of fascism and neo Nazism is the immigration, migration in both sides. Like the people that they are foreign and they live in Greece and the Greeks that they are leaving the country on a new massive wave of people that they are uh, leaving the country w against their will to go re left, right and center to have to, uh, on the chase of a better life, of a decent life, or you name it, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, but um, and the people that they have stayed in, the foreigners that they have come to Greece uh, to help a lot of people with the, especially the system primary, but a lot of petty bourgeois as well, people that they, they had aspirations of uh, making money uh, with the backs of uh, cheap labor, they managed to help them very much so all these years. Uh, like other countries, Greece is not an, a, a unique phenomenon. And now that uh, things deteriorate, they have no use of them, so they want them out. It's like uh, the, tr the thing that they're dealing with, uh, I don't know, not even animals these days, we would uh, refer to as that. Like, once you are in, you're doing my job, next minute you are not doing, you can get out of the way. You know? And these people can't get out of the, of the country because they don't have papers. But so there are people living in Greece for more than 10 years who, uh, with, who have absolutely no papers. They, they belong nowhere. Uh, and. Three years ago, was it that uh, the law was um, the, uh, introduced to have the kids who were born in Greece to be recognized uh, as Greek citizens? Before that, there were children born in the country and they would not have any citizenship. So they had absolutely no right to travel anywhere, to get educated, nothing. Uh, but the thing now with the immigrants is that uh, mo the vast majority of them is left without jobs because many, many immigrants were living, were, were working in constructions and now the constructions are frozen, not, nothing is working. So uh, these people are left w without jobs, they can't go anywhere and, they, and many of them commit crimes. And so the crime rate is going higher and higher every day. Every day you see in the news uh, people killing each other for 100 euro, for 200 euro. It's, it's like uh, human life had no no value anymore. It's it's terrible. And uh, what Hostess mentioned about Greek people living in the country, I'd like to men uh, add that uh, some years ago, like some decades ago, there were many uh, Greek people leaving the country and going to Australia, or Canada, or the states. But the thing is that these people were going there to work, uh, like as as workers. Now you have the educated people, the young people who can't find jobs there because. The, um, the unemployment within the young people is more than 50%. Uh, so you have the educated people with, with dreams to do something good in their life and to achieve something, leaving the country and probably not to come back because the situation is going, uh, it seems to be going down and down. So. And another thing that is related to the situation that is amazing, like, uh, to see the parallels from back in time or history repeats itself <laughs> in a way, right? It's the massive amount uh, of neighborhoods as well of uh, pawn shops uh, that in Greece they are very much associated uh, with the Nazi occupation. Uh, they haven't seen a rise of pawn shops in Greece uh, since 1941, 1942 and uh, that uh, there was, m there was a, a big famine in the cities uh, especially in Athens and Thessaloniki, um, that caused uh, hundreds of thousands of deaths. 
um, because of the, um, the policy of the, the Nazis of taking away the grain and the, the food uh, supplies, the local food supplies, to send them to the front to, to complete the oper Operation Barbarossa. Right. So they were people that they had the means to uh, to to operate in the black market, and they have opened pawn shops back there that they force a lot of people to sell whatever they could sell. Like we're talking about uh, a few uh, pieces of furniture that might worth something to to a golden tooth, or yeah, I know that it sounds uh, hilarious, but it is a fact. And uh, they have rose out of the, the blue in Greece, and they have, uh, uh, especially to the elderly, they have passed a lot of, uh, uh, they have brought them sievers, thinking that things can go that bad yeah, by seeing, seeing all these things happening. Uh, I suppose uh, what I'm seeing beyond all these things, I've seen a, a great, uh, having read something recently about the, the Argentina experiment, right, that is very much talked in Greece uh, uh, the last two, three years now. It's, there is a lot of parallels. It's a similar situation. It's not the same situation. Of course, it's not the same. We're talking about different countries and different cultures and different uh, uh, financial, social and cultural situations. But there are very many similarities that are um, uh, frightening people when they see what happened in Argentina uh, once the IMF came in to, to bring the, the interests of the new liberal capital in the country uh, to enforce them. And what's happened in Greece? There's a lot of things that they are, of course, they are not the same. Like, for example, uh, Argentina had already privatized most of its uh, 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 state assets. Greece it still holds a few. Uh, so there was less interest on that. Then I suppose there is natural resources, there is uh, eco-capitalism, that is another big issue in Greece. There is a lot of struggle regarding that, uh, especially in the islands, in Crete actually, it's a massive thing, um, uh, with uh, uh, big, uh, massive companies, French, German, the multinationals actually, they are not so much labeled as such, they might have a base in these countries. That they're coming in and they want to take about advantage of the solar and wind, uh, wind uh, of the islands to actually transport the energy for for profit, and they have found a lot of resistance there. But it is part of the problem too. Well, so that actually kind of ties into something else I wanted to bring up, which is actually <coughs> the uh, the story about the pawn shops. Why the pawn shops? I mean, you know, it's an example how of how there's always going to be a set of people who will use these conditions of misery to make themselves richer. Uh, and it, it's part of the, the, I think the global pattern of the crisis is that one of the things that's been quite invisible within it is the relatively large wealth tra transfer that's happened to you know, the richest, 0.01% or, or whatever. Um, and it's visible in a lot of countries. But there was an interesting blog on the Guardian website the other day that kind of talked about how the, you know, the, the, the Greek elite, the wealthy section of Greek society really went being particularly affected uh, by this crisis. Um, and it kind of, you know, the, the way these things get portrayed, like in Ireland as much as anywhere else, is that, oh, this affects every, we all partied, it affects everybody, now we all have to tighten our, our belts, where it appears the reality in Greece as here is actually, well, no, it's most of society are expected to do the belt tightening. And then the people who made the money out of the situation in the first place, well, they intend to make more money out of it. But uh, I don't know if you had a chance to look at that. Um. Uh, uh, I, I think that um, that's a universal thing. Like, for example, um, uh, nobody would should expect that the, the rich will suffer in Greece because of the downturn of the economy, and they don't. Apparently, they don't. Cayman Islands and Swiss banks and all these uh, tax heavens and money heavens, they are open for the Greeks as well. Uh, they don't check their passports, they just want their money and they want to make, put the profits outside. In the meantime, uh, they keep it a low profile as, I, I read it as well and I saw it as well. They do stay away because they know that uh, people, they can focus on uh, the guys that are actually uh, making out of the misery of the people. And when you are flashy on periods as such, it doesn't go down well for the people. 
you becoming a target. So wisely enough for them, they managed to stay away in nearby islands. So are you ready to? And I'm not surprised I've seen them. Idra, Spetses, you know that they are on the Gulf of um, Attica. You know, there to the Peloponnese goes down. It's kind of like a massive sea area with a lot of islands there. And uh, uh, they might be greedy, they might be serving capitalism, but they are not thick. Uh, so that explains a lot of thing, uh, things. Another thing that I, ha I read and wasn't on the Guardian is that a lot of them, they have managed to push a lot of uh, money out of the country. But uh, another similarity to the Argentinian uh, situation, when capitalist uh, uh, or petty bourgeois, immediate bourgeois, so that things they going very bad, they push a lot of capital outside of the country or turn it into other currencies or even gold and deposit somewhere else so they will have a safe, uh, a safe option for later on. So that happened in Greece as well and it has been reported even, reported even on the mainstream media, it's not a secret, like they know that they... Yeah, there's been a huge... Um bank run basically in Greece and because of the way the eurozone works that when Greek banks need to get more euros so the rich people can take it out they have to take the money from the euro system through the system called target 2 and what the Germans are now saying is that if Greece is evicted from the eurozone all of those debts the target 2 money that the Greece owes the country to the rest of the eurozone ie all the money the rich people have taken out and put in their Swiss banks are going to become, of course, the, the property of the Greek people. Mm. So that's yet another layer on top, if you like. Uh, there's another thing that I want to mention, all right, that uh, I have heard a lot of talk on the mainstream, and especially during the, during the elections, the two elections, the, the one that happened already and the one that's coming up now. And there is a big debate, and actually even the left parties are going along with that, like Syriza, right? Syriza. Um, and that's uh, about uh, growth. Everybody is promising to the Greek people growth. And they say that without growth, they can't get out of the situation. Uh, I think that uh, libertarians and anarchists in Greece, they have a different approach from what I'm reading. And what they're talking, and actually I'm behind that, is sustainability. Uh, growth can go as far as, I don't know, a height, the next height, and then what? You can't grow forever. But sustainability is the manage of your resources in cooperation with other parts of society to build something that has life, a base, a base that has life and can support the social structure of a country. Everybody's talking like growth, and it has been taken from a capitalist terminology, a capitalist way of talking and uh, that uh, doesn't see barriers, doesn't see uh, stop to nothing. Um, it's that kind of logic that you can have people in Mars at the same time that you have a whole continent like Africa uh, dying from poverty and disease and to them is no skin off their nose. Like they can live with that. and. I don't know what kind of sacrifices that can be made on, the, on, on that single uh, word, the word growth. Uh, I think this is what we, uh, this is a big battle that's happening in Greece here, between the people that they are. They're growing for the guys that they can make money out of the growth and, and step on the bodies of the other ones that they will help that growth and sustainability that will favor the vast, the vast, uh, vast amount of people that they have been left on the side for years and not only in Greece of course. So let's let's move on to talk about resistance. Um, I mean Greece unlike unlike Ireland has seen some pretty significant uh, resistance to the attempts to pose the force the crisis. I mean there's been a number of general strikes uh, and of course uh, probably the thing that most anarchists are most familiar with is that there has been a lot of intense rioting and street fighting. Um, we're now in the situation where Houdini seems to be putting the hope in the electoral process. Uh, in terms of, you know, I mean, in, in terms though of what, what has been happening to date, like, do you, do you see that there's going to be more strikes in the future, or, 
or wh where has that movement got to? Like, where's the kind of popular movement that was more based around direct action got to? Is it the case as it appears that suddenly it's all electoral, or is that just because this is the point we're at? Uh, I think what's happening is that uh, people are uh, threatened now that uh, if they do more strikes, if they do uh, come out the streets, uh, they they are taking the country back, and it's not good for us, and will. Uh, uh, the Germans will throw us out of Euro and people, people actually are afraid of that. So uh, it is the case that uh, during the last uh, two or three months with, within these uh, first and second elections, you don't see as much uh, as many strikes as uh, you normally had uh, before the first elections. Um, and it's like the whole society is waiting for these elections on Sunday. Um, and nothing seems to be working in uh, in any uh, governmental service. You you don't get people deciding. Everybody's waiting for what's going to happen. Um, and uh, there are there are people who I have talked with who are saying that they don't care about which government uh, gets elected. They just need a government because it's uh, it's like the stability uh, thing that was written in the. Irish uh, referendum for yes, like people want stability, they want to be sure that uh, they will not go back to Drachmi and it will, uh, it will be Euro after some day. So. Uh, there's things that are easily seen about uh, what's happened in Greece with the resistance and the movement in general, but uh, things that you can really see. Uh, what you can see is that, for example, the last election uh, a month ago, it was 35% of people that uh, they abstain. An abstention that is crazy for Greek standards, I think that was the highest abstention uh, from an election uh, ever, ex with the exception of a local authority election that had a slightly uh, bigger percentage, a, few, a couple of years back, I think. Um, now, having said that, um, uh, the truth is that uh, there is uh, there is no easy solutions for no movement or no uh, resistant movement anywhere in the world. The massive world, actually, as we see it uh, in Greece, but in all over the place, I suppose, is education, political education, and not only in theory but in practice. Like uh, there is no way if people they don't start learning to practice democracy, and I mean always I'm referring to direct democracy, with all these things attached to it, uh, justice, equality, uh, respect um, uh, for um, the sexual preferences, and, and uh, against racism, of course, you know, like a, with a humanist, altruist base, then you're not going to see any change whatsoever. Uh, like, primarily, I see that uh, I know that it's kind of classic that they say it a lot back home, but it's true. Democracy starts from home, and it goes, it spreads out. It is a base thing. It starts from home. It goes out to community. It goes down, uh, down to the, the working place, and this is how it works. I know that it sounds very easy, but the difficulty of that is to put people to start practicing, practicing it. The good and the bad thing about the austerity and uh, the turmoil that uh, uh, taking place to Greece because of the policies of the new liberals and the capitalists, uh, the liberal, new liberal capitalists in Greece, is that actually there is more aware, awareness of the people. People they start realizing, but of course there is no such thing as I see it personally as a speed course, education course for uh, uh, activists or uh, people that they want to, take, to, to join the movement and do things that they will help their lives. It takes time. And I think that time is another magic word, education and time. And um, this is how things work. And regardless of high austerity or low austerity, it needs, it, it needs to take a course and that course uh, unfortunately, it's it's slow and painful, but uh, this is how it works. 
Yeah, I think to pick up on what Irma was talking about earlier, to an extent, if you see the elections and the spectacle of the crisis in the media as an attempt to demobilize people, then in fact it has been successful. Um, and the, the fact, and I'd particularly like to point this out to those people on the left who think that elections are where you win things. I mean, it seems to me very clearly this whole electoral process is, up, up until now, is, a, is a, a measure of demoralization and defeat. Now, the election, you know, even the mainstream media say now, the election on Sunday is basically between anger and fear. Um, and, you know, all the powers that be in Europe are, are saying that vote for fear. You know, that's, that's the, the positive, you know, that, that's, that's all democracy has to after is next. Like, be afraid, be very afraid, put your cross against fear on the ballot paper. And that's where, you know, sort of our wonderful, like, 21st capitalist liberal democracy has brought us to. Um, but we can't underestimate the, the, the amount of demoralization that is causing, and of course, you know, if as people become more insecure in the streets, you know, from from crime feel personally insecure, that also creates, uh, you know, panic and so on. And it's not surprising that in those circumstances, people will vote for anyone that they think will make things more secure, yeah, that, even that, if it's that, based on that, lies. That was why the the Nazi yeah. got so much uh, so much in place because. From zero point two, which is their yeah. actual yeah. Uh, yeah. percentage, yeah. they went to six yeah. percent. I don't want to believe that six percent of the watchers, if it's uh, nearly half million people, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to believe that nearly half million people in Greece are Nazis because they are not. I, I live there and I know the people, mm. and they're not. So it's the afraid people, yeah. the, the threatened people mm. who are pushed in that way mm. because they are desperate. Mm. And when you're desperate, you, you do. You're forced to do this, this thing. But this is not, it's not any economic necessity that's creating these forces. This, as I say, this is being created at a political level at the yeah. European Union. Because I have a, a, a Greek colleague at work, and she says, uh, you know, we're guinea pigs. We are like rats in a laboratory cage. We're being experimented on mm -hmm. by the Eurozone of like, okay, how far can we push people? Uh, and get the result we want. Um, and I guess we're going to see, because I, I don't, you know, for me, I don't think Sunday's going to resolve anything. Um, so the, the question then after that is do, do people, how do people respond and go, okay, well, we still have to get over the problem of finding food. Um, you know, I hear you know, farmers are renting out pieces of land from people in the cities has got to the stage where people are having to to try and provide food for themselves and all the rest of it. So th there's all of those things, the actual processes of life that have to go on regardless. Um, and I guess we'll have to see what that brings in the future. To, to what extent is it true that one of the limitations for a kind of more direct action style resistance in Greece is that there isn't a solution within Greece? Um, you know, that what Greece is part of this European problem is having a huge amount of external costs imposed from the rest of Europe on it. And really, no matter what happens within Greece itself, that's the context people are, are caught within. So, you know, short of trying to, I mean, if you had a, an isolated revolution in Greece tomorrow, you know, you know, what would you have? Some sort of, you'd end up with something, you know, some sort of North Korean attempt at self sufficiency. I mean, is that a real limitation? Is it really? You know, the, the question isn't so much the strength or weakness of resistance in Greece, but the, the lack of solidarity coming from the rest of the European working class. Is, is there some truth in that? This, I mean, it reminds me very much of the, the situation in Derry in, in the late 60s, if you like. The, pe you know, the people there were not able to take on the whole might of the British army, the army of a country, of, of an imperial country as well, of 60 million people, just because of, of the weight of numbers. And like the eurozone is what four hundred million people, like eleven million Greeks can't can't take on the whole eurozone and expect to win. I mean, I know it's not a, a, a physical contest, of course. Sure, if it were, if it was possible to, to to get rid of austerity with Molotovs, it would have been done by now. But um, but 
but yeah, the, the, the balance of forces, the problem is, is the lack of a European level movement pushing back um, against sort of austerity for the periphery, if you like. And even today, the, the, uh, the chairman of the, um, the German chairman of, of the ECB, Jens Weidmann, has been putting forward Ireland as, as and Portugal as, as the good boys that, uh, you know, who have behaved well in our uh, memorandum and uh, Troika rule situation and, and uh, as a lesson to, to Greeks to take into the polling booth on Sunday. They, they like to play that card and they like to play um, whole people against each other. It's one of their favorite games. Um, the truth is that uh, it's country, it's bourgeois state or it's capitalist state. It has a lot of similarities, but there is a lot of differences within the capitalist state. Like, um, there is a lot of talk about the scandals and the corruption in Greece and uh, the system that collapsed, whatever. And a lot of the discussion, right, that comes from, uh, uh, how do you call it, um, people that are trying to find, uh, to make Greece look even a better escape, scapegoat than it is at the moment, right? Uh, they forget that it takes two to to create a scandal. For example, like there's a couple of massive scandals uh, in Greece at the moment, right? That they haven't been resolved. They never do. And the one is the the one the Zeman scandal, with the bribes that the Zeman's was giving to political parties, not only in Greece but in Germany and other countries, so they will promote their interests, right, on the specific countries. So there is the guys and political parties that they were receive on the receiving end with the big brown envelopes that actually it wasn't not even brown envelopes, there were big brown sacks of money. And of course there is the guy that bribes. That is the executives of Siemens or the political powers behind them, that they were buying these people, these political parties, to accept these kind of tactics. And then the other scandal is the, uh, the, uh, the one that they call it in Greece, the scandal of the tilted U-boats, the tilted submarines. They bought a couple of U-boats from Germany a few years back. A minister of defense from PASOK is in jail now. It has, he has stayed in jail because of the election. He wouldn't be in. But because of the elections, it, he's still in jail. And he got a big bribe to buy weaponry uh, from a country that plays that card as well of nationalism and outside enemies that they will attack the people so they have to have a massive spending on uh, military uh, um, massive military expenditure uh, 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 ex expenses all right and uh, he bought a couple of uh, submarines that they were tilting they were fault they were faulting and uh, he got a big bribe of course but somebody the armed industry of germany gave the bribe. So there is two sides of the corruption. There is the Greek politicians and uh, the civil servants and the guys that they were involved on receiving the money. And the, of course, there is on the other side, there is the German ministry that was passing the packets and the companies that they were belonged to the German state. So there you are, that myth of the corruption, uh, of the Greek corrupt state, uh, doesn't stand, uh, it is valid, but it's not only Greece. And uh, <laughs> the other one is about um, um, EU and how Greece joined the Eurozone. Uh, even the dogs in the streets in Greece, they know that the government of PASOK back then fixed the numbers to join the, to join the Eurozone. But apparently, the guys that they want Greece into the Eurozone, that was actually the French the Germans uh, governments at the time, uh, more than the rest, they knew about it and they went alone. So there's a lot of questions to be asked about uh, corruption and scandal, and uh, Greece uh, doesn't have the, 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 uh, the copyright there. Uh, now, there is something else that I know, being living in Ireland, that's happened here as well. 
it has to do with nepotism and favoritism. That's another symptom of, as we call it in Greece, pseudo-capitalist system. Because in Greece it's not even a capitalist system. Um, and actually it happens in Ireland as well. Like in Ireland there is well documented uh, cases of nepotism, like sons and daughters and nephews. The difference between the Greeks and the Irish, for example, is that the, the Greeks, they have a thing that they're allowed, and they, when they put the sun into the same state company, they will go out and demonstrate it on the whole neighborhood to know. The Irish, they do it more kind of quiet. That's not it. So, you know, there is that thing as well. Unless you're the Healy Rays, in which case you set the road to like the <laughs> Yeah. But I guess they're further south near the Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, now, um, it's, it's, it's hard, it's hard going because, you know, like, um, these dilemmas, when they are placed and uh, this change of uh, situation well, and all these fears and the blackmail to the people, when they are placed, uh, under these circumstances of rise of Nazism and unemployment and uh, uh, homelessness and all the rest, suicides, all the rest that we, people that have no food on the table, not even once a day, when you put them dilemmas as such, as they do the parties now in the elections, uh, it's very hard for somebody to face them if he doesn't understand the situation and uh, he hasn't got the, the right frame of mind, the education, I don't know what to say, but the only parallel that I can see is like, like somebody um, walks into a bank to rob a bank and sets a pistol on the head of the guy that works on, on behind the glass and he asks him for the money, you know, like, and what else you do? He gives the money. Like, he wouldn't play it here. Most of the times, it's, you don't play it here, you give the money. You want to try to stop the robbery, you know. It's, uh, these parallels are such, like, the blackmail is so massive, like, and the phenomena of the, uh, the, the, the consequences of what's happening, it's so severe that it's easy to blackmail people. It's easy to put dilemmas as such, you know, like. People that they haven't seen any better. Like. To desperate people. Desperate, yeah, to desperate people. But this, this was kind of the, the, the point I was driving at with the, with the question about the, well, the limited terrain of fighting within Greece itself. Um, I can't remember who came up with the slogan, whether they were fascist or Stalinist, but mm -hmm. it might have been Mussolini, but you know, uh, it was, you know, somebody was basically being asked about, well, you know, the, you're, you're trying to impose this thing on the vast majority of the population. How do you, you know, how do you achieve that? And if we look at the crisis in the European level, you know, you've got, you know, the 0.01 percent or whatever imposing the course of the crisis on the vast majority of the European population. It varies from country to country, and some countries, particularly the, the peripheral countries, are the, are the pigs. It's mm -hmm. much more severe, and others less severe, but it's happening everywhere. Uh, how do you do it? And their reply was, well, you know, you, it, it's like eating a salami. You know, you don't, you know, try and eat the whole thing, stuff the whole thing in your mouth at once, that would be impossible. You cut off a little slice and you eat that, and then you cut off another little slice and you eat that, and you work your way down. And that, what's happening at the moment in terms of the, the sort of attacks on living standards, workers' living standards around Europe, is very much like this. I mean, you know, the Greeks are the first slice of that salami, mm -hmm. and everybody else is kind of, to a certain extent, watching in stunned amazement. And, you know, if, if you're in Ireland or if you're in... Portugal, or if you're in Spain, you know, even Italy, you probably know that you know your slice <laughs> number three, four, five, six, seven, or eight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but pretty much, if you look at the organised union movements, you know, if, if if you look at most campaigns or struggles on the ground, Greece is is something we are spectating on. You know, like Greek resistance is something we're spectating on. But there isn't any sort of meaningful European movement of resistance or attempt to build it, despite the fact that I mean, we, we can look at this and go, okay, there's that slice going, we're number four here, or maybe yeah. we're number three, yeah. this is coming for us, and all we're doing is we're watching it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's that limitation. And also it, it becomes the boogeyman, you know, every country in Europe is now being told, be good or else you'll end up like Greece. Greece yeah. And you don't, wouldn't want that, would you, you know? So again, it's it's uh, th this this thing of, of like I said, my my good friend at work of, of being used as a guinea pig. 
and also as, as an example, uh, in French we say uh, an example to encourage the rest. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, on a moral level, we have to say this is a crime against humanity, what's been done to the Greek people over the last two years. On a systemic level, I think also we have to see that the whole way this, this question is being framed of the Euro crisis is being framed with this around this notion of contagion. That is to say, the Europe is, the Eurozone is mostly good and healthy and wholesome, but some, there's some little rotten bits around the periphery. And that sometimes, you know, maybe if we either bully them into submission, or if necessary, get the scalpel out and cut them off, we will get rid of the unhealthy bits, of the diseased bits. And uh, the Eurozone will go back to being as it were. Now the fact is, I think that whole framing is completely wrong. I don't, I don't mean wrong on a moral level, I mean just factually wrong. Because the, the problem of the Eurozone, the disease goes everywhere. Right? This system doesn't work. It doesn't just work for, not work for Greece, Portugal, Spain and Ireland. It doesn't work for anybody. Because, you know, all the way down the slices eventually you get to, you know, after Spain comes Italy, after Italy comes, guess who owes the most money in the world to Italy? Well, it's France, ha ha! <laughs> you know, and then so on and so forth. So there's, there's, this process doesn't stop. That salami goes all the way down to the, the little bit of string at the end. I, I actually read The Economist this morning and they were making a point that, uh, you know, I've got, um, like, for, for the Germans, they were looking at France and where Holland was talking about increasing the pension age. You know, so how could that be allowed to happen? So you thought France is very much a piece of that salami yeah. on, on, the, on the way down there. Um, yeah. There's something about that salami that I think uh, myself that um, there was probably a bigger one further back and that bigger salami it was um, Latin America. The experiment started there and started to, people they know about that, like everybody knows about it. It started from the 70s with uh, Pinochet and then later on to what, uh, earlier on to Guatemala, it was pretty much on, on, on the same basis and then to Argentina and Brazil and uh, it has uh, lots of victims, a whole nation, whole countries, people among people that they are, they were treated like guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. But it seems like um, in one state, like even ourselves, you know, I'm talking from being Greek, like uh, we were staying these things, we're reading about them, we were uh, um, uh, seeing documentaries on the telly and they were distant. They were distant, they were there. And uh, somehow, we, all of us, we thought that they would never arrive to us. They have nothing to do with civilized Europe or I don't know how people they might have seen uh, that thing. Greece, actually, not only Greece, but Greece is the extreme of the whole pigs uh, clique, right, or group, uh, is that actually disproves that and shows that actually the interests of these people, that they represent all these corporations and whatever, they go beyond that. They go beyond Latin America, beyond Africa, because Africa is a victim of them. Like, nobody talks, they have wiped out Africa, with the exception of Northern Africa, that was uh, the North Africa state, they had a different status there, because they had to deal with the Mediterranean, and they had the, the colonials that were there till the 60s. But, to an extent, they wipe out a, a whole continent, and then the Latin American countries, and now it's here. Now it's here, there is no hiding from it, like, it is here in the countries that we sit here and we speak before we even go to express our solidarity with the Greeks or start, you know, like, try to understand what's happening there in a country that's two, two, three, two, two, three, two and a half thousand miles away in the same continent, we have to understand that the phenomenon, the, the, the situation is taking place in this country as we speak. One thing that I is one thing that I saw and one thing that I heard, I saw the soup kitchens in Smithfield, and uh, at the same time I'm delivering mail in uh, upper uh, collecting mail in Upper Bucket Street, in Paul's Bridge, and these people they have no idea that on the same town, just a couple of kilometers away on the other side there is people that they are every day they queuing for a couple of slices of bread 
and a bowl of soup. Because if they don't get them, they have no means of surviving. And the other thing that I didn't see, but I have heard, is that after years, there was a soup kitchen start operating down in Cork. And I don't know how many decades since the last time. And these are the same symptoms, the same exactly symptoms, from the same exactly, exactly, exact source that they have caused the bad havoc in Greece and they have arrived in Ireland and probably I assume without knowing because I can speak only for Greece and Ireland in Portugal as well in Spain there is we see what's happening with all different uh, parts of society there as well the, uh, it is here like uh, the, if I had to say something the last thing that I'm going to say is that people they should, no, they should, they should look to Greece they should understand, they should show the solidarity with the Greeks. But it's happening here, and it has started a long time ago. We just now, on that little in exclusive club that is part of the salami, we are a, a slice very close to Greece on that salami. Well, okay, so I'm getting towards the end here, but and that kind of neatly segues into. The thing that, I mean, what we're looking at here, because we've mostly been talking about it at the Greek level and then the European level, but it is, of course, a global crisis. Um, and it's a global crisis in which, you know, the very small elite has been not only protecting its wealth, but expanding it. Um, it's a crisis that comes at the same time as we're seeing this growing environmental crisis, like climate change being the one people talk about the most. But there's this set of things that are happening that mean that the world as we've known it um, you know, in terms of the capitalist world as we've known it, whatever about problems it had, it's become something that looks to be much less possible as we move into the future. Um, you know, that this this crisis is basically is coming. Like, I, I, I don't be melodramatic, and I'm, I'm not inclined to take this as a simple statement on its face value, but to a certain extent, it is perhaps the final crisis in that sort of sense of can we recreate that? You know, can we have another 30 or 40 years of? unfettered growth to get us to the next crisis and the next crash. Well, maybe we can, but I couldn't really see it actually working again at the other side of that. Like, we do seem to be getting to this point in history where the, the system itself has just simply become unsustainable. Like, it, 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 it's not logical, but it's also just in terms of the havoc, it, 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 it's now wrecking, it's just not possible for people forward anymore. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I, I, I think we were talking about seeing things that were being done in Latin America in the 70s and the 80s now happening within Europe itself, if you like to, I guess, or, or probably our Latin American comrades could see that from the point of view of the chickens coming home to roost, or you could see it as, as sort of like the, um, the, the empire eating itself, if you like, um, starting from the extremities inwards. But the, it seems to me that in a world where, you know, the old colonial world that started the 20th century where industrial capitalism was concentrated in North America, Western Europe, and a little bit Japan, and the rest of the world was its, its colonial playground. That now, that, and then after the, the cold, you know, during the Cold War, the world was split into these three worlds model of the first world, the second world, the, the communist world, Russia and China, and then the, the third world. That is, globalization has meant that, you know, China is now the, the emerging industrial superpower, um, and, you know, even uh, parts of Latin America, for example, that uh, 20 years ago were all under dictatorships, are now, uh, to a certain extent, becoming industrial powers and relatively free, or freer anyway, than uh, they were 20 years ago. So as sort of the, the West sort of spreads around the world, then also the, the third world has to come back in as well. So the, there's a kind of an evening out that we're, we're starting to get a, all, all three worlds are, are starting to, to be everywhere at once, if you like. Um, but yeah, I think I, I've spoken in other contexts that the, the environmental crisis and the economic crisis seem to me to be very clearly linked now in the sense that we have this this idea of growth as soon as there's any hint of growth in the markets the oil prices go up 
and then the growth goes down again and we're stuck in this this, this stagnation and again it's not just left people saying this it's, it's you know any people observers of the global economy um, and the extent that if you know if all of China and India start driving as many cars as Western Europeans and Americans say, oh, we're all going to choke to death. There's no two ways about it. Um, or run out of oil and fertilizer and so on. So I, any which way you look at it, the continued growth along the trajectory that we have been going on since, really since the 19th century, becomes increasingly unimaginable. Um, and at the same time, you know, we still do have all of the resources for everyone to eat well and to be healthy. So it, it's finding a way of, of bridging that gap. But it needs to come onto the agenda now. I think that this this whole thing from the, you know, you see the supposed left in the Greek election, Syriza and whoever, at the end of the day, their solution is more capitals and more growth. And like, we need an alternative to, to that alternative. There's a good point there about the... There's a struggle between them, actually. Syriza, from my point of view, represents that. Is there's a struggle about the, the new liberal capitalism that it's actually it's thriving at the moment with all these policies. And the Keynesians, and actually Syriza, even though that is actually preaching that it's a left, a coalition of left parties and everything, it's standing up for a state capitalistic model, or more state, or more... Uh, and less, without excluding the private top, uh, uh, the private, the private, uh, how you call it, the, the private uh, uh, sector. Sector. sector, yeah, involvement, right? But it's this is what we're talking. About. The argument is not uh, uh, about sustainability. It's not about the environment. It's not about the poor. It's not about equality, justice, democracy. The argument is about who is gonna get the pie and how the pie is going to divide it between the same old parties without including the vast majority of the people. And there is a lot of people, I'm reading it every day, that they say the environmental disaster, global environmental disaster, is not that far as we previously thought. And that's a consequence of this kind of greed of this kind of policies, of uh, this system, all over the world, they have managed to bring upon us. And that's capitalism, like uh, growth for creating wealth for a specific amount of people, for to line specific pockets, when the rest of us, we suffer. On, in so many different ways, like we can take cases here, analyzing every consequence of what's happening out there. It's it's unbelievable. Uh, the one last thing that I, I'll say myself is that um, even th what we witness in here, these systems, all right, that they are uh, they have suffocated, all right, um, on the last uh, as we see it as a last attempt to stay a float, or right, a system, uh, they are not going to go down by themselves. They definitely are not going to go down themselves. They need, oh, they, we need all of us to understand what we're dealing with and bring forward direct, direct democratic practices with equality and sustainability so we can turn the page for real and not politicians' words as they used to do. This is one of the expressions actually of Caesar, turn the page or turn, change the book or something like that. But uh, that they don't mean that much. But if there are not people behind all these things, I don't see it changing whatsoever. Emma, one word to you. Um, I, I don't have anything uh, more to add to that. Uh, the only thing is that as, as many books as series are forever changes, as, uh, as long as you have people uh, who have far more uh, than they actually need to survive, there will be people who have less than uh, they, they need to survive. So it, it, it's a uh, political issue, it's, it's something that has to do with the, uh, how the capitalist system works, and 
flower there is where whether it's a series or uh, a democracy or a flower um, think that if we have the capitalist system it's not going to work for everybody so there, there will be people um, fainting at schools because they don't have uh, food to eat or uh, young people losing, losing their jobs and immigrating to other countries and um, the, the Nazis uh, uh, getting a good chance of becoming famous out of it and uh, things getting worse so the, the only uh, solution would be not to capitalize it. Okay, thank you.